Hello, everybody. My name is Errol Rappaport. Welcome to a continuing podcast series sponsored by the Daisy Joplin Music Mentoring Foundation. The series is called Rappaport in Resonance, A Dream of Passion. Now, Daisy Joplin and the band just finished an incredible concert on Bannerman Island, Bannerman Castle Island. And we're going to be re-interviewing all the band members. And I'm going to start out with the first, my first interview is with Simon Fishburn, who plays on the drums, but I, I, I feel that he plays a lot of other instruments. And he's over here from Australia. So, hello, Simon. Oh, hi, Errol. <laughs> How you doing? I was just doing a little, little bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's Michael. So, He's the body percussionist. <laughs> right. So, so um, Simon, how did you get started in in a love for music or, you know, in the music business? My grandfather played by ear. He, he'd pick up any instrument, um, mainly the, the harmonica and uh, on my mother's side and, and would play. My father's side has music in the family too, but when I was growing up, there was nothing really going on in the house. Mum had a piano. She tried to get me playing piano when I was four, but I just didn't take to it. I'd sit there and poor old Mrs. Perry, you know, she had to deal with me trying to find middle C. And I'd be like banging away at a, at a key trying to find <laughs> middle C. And I'd look at mum and mum was going, that way, that way. And I'd be like, dong, no, dong. And so I didn't, I didn't uh, continue with the piano. But then when I was about seven, um, well, I think my mum already, you know, my parents already saw that I had a passion for music. Um, but my neighbor was wanting to start or to, to join a local community band, a wind band. Mm -hmm by the name of the Hornsby Concert Band, because I grew up in Australia, Sydney, Australia. And uh, so there's plenty of, you know, marching bands and community bands there. And um, he, he wanted to play the trumpet and I didn't know what to play. And mum said, well, what about the, the gentleman in church that plays the clarinet? And I went, the what? <laughs> now, by this stage, I'd already been playing maybe the recorder, you know, over here in the States, I think you call it a flute, but you know, it's not that flute, it's the recorder, right? Which a lot of preschool yeah. children or, or kindy kindergarten so did you did you have this did you go to a mu you know, music classes in school no not until later so i remember sitting in the hornsby concert band trying to put this five piece clarinet together and we were sitting there i was super nervous um i didn't know what really the instrument was everyone was like warming up and there was drummers and trumpets playing and and we had to ask the the, the little boy next to us how, how to put the instrument together and my mum was like kneeling beside me we were trying to put the instrument together and I kind of learnt there. Um, so I don't know if I had a, a like a passion for music. I can't really recall having a passion for music then. But I remember just taking to the clarinet and loving it. And I went in competitions. Um, and this is before I even went to high school. When wow. I was in elementary school or primary school, as we call it in Australia, there was there was no music opportunities. There was nothing really. We'd sit around and play on tambourines and stuff like that, but there was no. So I was playing the clarinet, you know, in this outside concert band, a community concert band. And then by the time I got to high school, I was already quite accomplished. So I got into the, the school um, band and mum made sure that I went to a school. It was uh, St. Pius Tenth College in Chatswood on the North Shore of Sydney. And she made sure that I got into a concert band there and a jazz band and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's when I started taking formal lessons from an oboe player by the name of Pauline Strait. Um, uh -huh. Bless her. She was wonderful and she taught me a great technique. So I learned classical clarinet from the age of seven. And then when I was sitting there playing the clarinet, this is my clarinet, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. And I was like fifth clarinet, right? Because there's like a thousand clarinets all sitting there honking away. I was looking over at the guy playing the drums because that's what was really drawing my attention. And I was like, ooh, I want to be able to do that. So I said to my mum, I want a drum kit for my birthday. And I was around about nine. Turning nine ten. years old <laughs> yeah so i got a drum kit for my birthday um on my 10th birthday and uh, my first drum teacher was that guy and i was super wow. nervous because he had the cool hair and the sunglasses he chewed gum his name was mark feist and he's now a famous well i don't know if he's famous but he's a he's a well-known producer in la now and um but back at the back then he was 15 i was 10 he was my first drum teacher um and, but but I was also other than that I was doing a, a little co a rock band the, the neighbor was a guitarist so that's where I started playing rock drums and then so I wait, 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 when did you realize it was a business 
and you had to make money doing it. Um, I started playing musicals in high school and getting paid for that. So I was probably about 15 or 16. So I've been playing for about five years and I was getting, you know, we'd get 30 bucks a show, um, you know, to play in the local musicals in Greece and Pirates of Penzance and all that sort of stuff. But then when I left school, oh, by the way, very important. Uh, my mother said, I'll buy you a drum kit, but you, you have to promise me one thing. Don't ever give up playing the clarinet. So... I still have it <laughs> and I still play it and I still teach it. That's a big part of what I do is I, I teach teach it, which is why I'm really loving the, the foundation that Daisy started because it's all about mentoring and education of the young children or young people, I'm going to say. Um, but anyway, so um, I kept playing the clarinet and then my, um, my high school music teacher said to me when I was leaving high school, and about to go off to college or try to go off to college to do to study music he said why don't you come back and teach some clarinet so that's that was my first music job playing uh teaching the clarinet when did you come to the states why did you come to the states i came to the states january 12th 2012 so it'll be nine years this 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 january um, I came here, I was th years of age, <laughs> well yeah. past my prime of being like a rock star and all that stuff. And I really gave up the, the, the dream um, of being an international musician, touring the world, playing on the world stage. And it wasn't until I met someone back in Sydney in a music shop when I was teaching drums to like 50 students a week and doing camps and all that sort of stuff and bands. I used to coach bands and things like that. So I met this guy and he was an American and he said, listen, I'm living here now, but I want you to be in my band and then I'm going to go back to New York. And I'm like, I can't do that. You know, I'm years of age and my life is here. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, wow, what happened to my dream? And then I started speaking to a couple of people and they said, look, Simon, you can always come back to Australia. You can always pick up some students again. And, you know, your family and friends are here. We love you and support you. Why don't you give it a go? I love New York. I've been here a number of times. I studied jazz at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, um, fell in love with jazz. My first time in New York was in 97. I uh, came here on my own to see the JVC Jazz Festival. Um, so I got to meet uh, Max Roach and... Um, um, uh, um, you know, just a whole bunch of amazing um, drummers and musicians at the time. I can't remember exactly who, <laughs> who was there, but that was my first time to, to New York. And I remember landing and I said to myself, I'm home. And it took me aback. I'm like, what do you mean you're home? It was just something I said in my head. And it was weird. And I thought, well, maybe that's because I watched Sesame Street and The Muppets and The Cosby Show and blah, 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 all these shows when I was a kid. But I just found I just needed to be in New York. So the two things kind of came together and, and I moved over here and I've been here for nine years almost. Wow. So let me ask you a question. You teach a lot of children. What, what is the, um, what's the thr what, what thrill do you get when you're teaching children? I mean, what's your biggest thrill? I mean, what? And I understand you, you, you also teach a lot of children. Yeah, I teach til children and I perform for children as well. So I now have a little thing that I do called Mr. Simon Music. Um, and people can look that up at mrsimonmusic.com. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook and all that sort of stuff. And basically, I fell into that. Um, yeah, I, I, I do private teaching. And I've done private teaching, as I said, since I was about 17 when I left school. And, uh, you know, I had a, a, a great little teaching practice back home in Sydney before I left here. But when I came here, I was on a performance visa. So, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I didn't do any, any teaching. I was just here playing in bands. And it was quite refreshing just to sort of be here as a musician again and not be an educator. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I kind of fell into playing, you know, I mean, I play guitar um, as a hobby, right? So, you know, I just sort of like, you know, you know, campfire stuff. You know, I picked it up when I was about 27, um, well into my, you know, my music career. And it was just something I just wanted to do. And, uh, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything serious. And, you know, just learning a couple of, you know, U2 songs and some, you know, Aussie pub songs and so on. And then, um, yeah, I, I discovered this musician who said, I think you'd be great with kids. And I'm like, well, yeah, I love kids, but I'm not going to become a wiggle. I don't want to become the the next Wiggles. What? Anyway. What's the, wiggle? what's the Wiggles? Oh, what's the Wiggles? 
I'm sure a lot of people know what the Wiggles are <laughs> that might be watching. They're a very famous uh, group of musicians that uh, they, do, they do children's music. So, you know, they, they actually sold out Madison Square Garden five nights in a row to <laughs> <See what I'm... laughs> two, three, four, five year olds. Um, and um, I don't know, it just seemed like I don't want to do kids music. I'm a serious musician, right? But then um, when I started playing for kids, it was just delightful. And I just I just loved it. And I said to my mum, send me a kookaburra because the kids know kookaburra sits in the old gum tree. Mary, Mary, king of the bush, right? They know that, that song over here. For some reason, the Americans know that song. So I said, Mum, send me over like a puppet of a, of a kookaburra, which is a bird, right, from Australia. And she sends me this. <laughs> this is not a kookaburra. Hoi! <laughs> this is a koala. So I'm like, what am I going to do with this guy? So he came out and started climbing up the guitar, you know, and doing all sorts of stuff. Hoi! A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Mr. Koala just fell asleep. <gasps> And then the kids, they went bananas. And I'm like, I think I'm onto something here. And so I kind of carved this niche for myself. I'm not a wiggle. I'm I'm Mr. Simon, because the kids over here, they call you by your first name. You'd be Mr. Errol, you know, and Miss Daisy and blah, blah, blah. Right. So I just, just became Mr. Simon. And, um, and, you know, like through the pandemic, I, I, I went virtual on online. I did a whole bunch of streams and videos and... It kept me busy. I got the green screen happening and I, you know, do all the different backgrounds. <laughs> you know, you know, let's go to the farm, kids. Um, and all that sort of business. Now I've got to try and find my background again. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'll tell you what, let's do this one. This is a nice one, too. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I do. But, um, yeah, teaching music, you know, I've got a couple of students that I that I that I mentor um and we went virtual as well through the pandemic and uh so i teach guitar clarinet some piano um and drums as well so i was looking up on on your website you do something called sci-fi yeah okay what is so that all about <sighs> okay so my name is simon fishburn and my nickname is sci-fi and i always wanted to have my own band so you know while i was over here doing all these bands playing for all these you know local bands around new york I really wanted to do something that was really passionate to me. I, I studied jazz at the conservatorium. I grew up playing rock. Um, I love funk music and disco music, and I just wanted to kind of pull that all together. So I created a band that played electro pop funk, and oh, I called it like sci-fi in the city sleuth or something like that, you know, and people were just like, get rid of the city sleuth, just call it sci-fi. So my band is called sci-fi and, um, at the time, I was playing in a band, a, a number of bands, and one of the bands had Lavondo Thomas on bass. So that's where I met Lavondo, who's the bass player for Daisy, as you all right. know. We're gonna we're, we're gonna introduce we're gonna interview him in, in about a couple of days. Oh yeah, he's got some great stories to tell. Um, and uh, so he became my bass player. I said I loved Lavondo. He was just so funky. We we had so much in common. Um, he's just such a wonderful human being, um, just, just, just so dear to my heart. And then he, he tried to get me on the China tour in 2019 with Daisy. And unfortunately I couldn't do it. It was a two month tour and I just couldn't do it. Um, but then, then he, then he called me up later on in the year in, I think it was like September, October and said, Hey, listen, Daisy's doing a gig at the Paramount theater in Peekskill. And she's looking for a drummer. Would you be interested again? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, I'm, I'm here. Let's do it. So that's where so I was. that Daisy. So was that when you met Daisy? Yep. But when did you really meet Daisy? Here we go. I mean, meeting Daisy is, 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 a, is an experience. <laughs> it is. It is. I met her in the rehearsal. Like uh, maybe it was a week or two weeks before the gig. We only had one rehearsal. I was nervous as anything because I had a whole lot of repertoire to learn. You know, there's all that Who stuff. There's the Vivaldi. There's all her tunes. Um, and, you know, it was all charted out. Like, everything's charted. You know, like, a, and I'm a reader. So, you know, because I grew up reading and learning how to read music, as well as, like, playing by ear as well, you know. And for people that are listening, what does that mean? It doesn't mean... It doesn't literally mean playing by out my ear it means being able to just pick up something and play in tune just by like having a conversation and music to me is having a conversation 
So, right. um, so I, I do that, but, uh, yeah, that's where I met, that's where I met Daisy in, in the rehearsal and she came in, hi everybody. Oh, yes. oh, it's so good to meet you. And Lavondo had warned me about Daisy. He'd sort of said, look, you know, I, I you know, like uh, Daisy, when Daisy said she's looking for a new drummer, um, you know, Lavondo was going through his, his, you know, his, uh, contact list thinking, and all these drummers and thinking, right, someone who can play all these different styles from reggae to jazz, to classical, to Scottish traditional. Like I had to learn that, you know, Scotland, the brave for, for the opening of, of Illuminance. Um, and, uh, and rock, of course, someone who could rock out. And Lavondo was like, mm, no, not that guy, not that guy, Simon. So that's when he called hey. me up and, uh, <laughs> You know, and it's just a match made in heaven because not only musically am I aligned with what Daisy's doing, but everything else. And we have a heritage that that is linked too. And I'm I'm I want to get together with Daisy a little bit more and 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 talk about this. But she's from England. My parents are from England. They immigrated to Australia in 1968, and I was born in 19. So <laughs> a few years later, after that. Um, so yes, I was born in Australia, but I'm first generation. So all my DNA is Northern England with a little bit of Nordic in there as well. So I'm, a, I'm part, part Viking. So look out. <laughs> so, so Simon, what was your experience like on, on Bataman Island? Where you had oh, to take, my goodness. you had, you know, it, 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 that was a very difficult to logistic wise. It seemed very difficult. Yeah. You know, it, you know, it, not, it, it was a challenge and look you know as a musician boy i mean i've played in wedding bands that's another thing that i do i play in event bands even here in new york i did it in australia and there are some you know brides and grooms out there that like have wild imaginations and this is where they want to get married so i've been on boats i've played on the back of trucks i've played in a space <laughs> that big like how do i get a drum kit in that space um, I've played on islands, I've played in India, I've played ballrooms, I've played, you know, big stages, little, every, you know, there's so much experience in my life that's, I, I think, you know, made it not so difficult for me at Bannerman Island. But yeah, when we saw those steps, we were like, Daisy, <laughs> this wasn't in the brochure. <laughs> You didn't tell us about these seventy-two steps. It wasn't yeah, in the job. It wasn't in the job description. <laughs> it wasn't in the job description. She's like, "Oh, I forgot to tell you about that." <laughs> right. Um, but you know, apart from that, and it was quite exhausting. Like we had to lug everything up those stairs: drums, PA. Like we all helped out. Um, Jeff had this huge weighted piano like a key. His keyboard is is weighted. You know, it's got lead in there. And Matthew, the the synth player the, the keyboard player and i were lifting this thing up it's like what is in here jeff's like that's my piano oh my goodness you mean it's like two percent plastic and like 98 percent lead all right <laughs> and we lugged it up these stairs um and we were quite exhausted the next day so we were actually happy that it was a bit of a rain day to be honest i think we're all like you know what <laughs> our muscles because being in isolation and and lockdown for five months i wasn't match fit i wasn't like you know I mean, I'd been practicing and that, but not loading gear up 72 stairs. So, so that was, that was huge, but the island, oh my goodness, what a, what a beautiful place. What a, what a location, what a backdrop that's in, you know, there's obviously the castle there behind you. Um, but you know, the Hudson Valley is just exquisite. And especially this time of the year, it wasn't this orange and red that I've got in my background, but the leaves are starting to, you know, to really change and. It was just, it was just magical. It's absolutely magical. And then when we got to see all the lights, it was a fairy tale. It really was a fairy tale. We, we created this amazing set, the music and the way Daisy created the flow of the show, you know, with her songs and, and the story, the chronological story of, 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 um, of Bannerman, you know, Frank Bannerman and his journey and how he built the castle and all that was just amazing. It was just amazing. So if this airs before the film airs in November, um, please get your tickets to see the live stream that's happening. Um, it's we just got told today the schedule is there's going to be four uh, four streams. There's two on 
Friday, the thir November the 13th, uh, the 14th of November, and then the 15th of November. And she's doing it at different times, so everyone around the world, so the, uh, people in Asia can see it, people in, in the, on the West Coast can see it, people in Europe can see it, and they don't have to get up at like two o'clock in the morning to do so. <laughs> so she's she's thinking big, she's thinking, we want to take this to the world. So, and, oh, and she, she, she's so. also, she's performed all over the world. So she has, you know, a following in, in all over the world. Um, right. I'm just looking, the schedule will be on the, on this, um, you know, podcast afterwards. But November 13th, she's doing the U.S., the East Coast at 7 p.m. Then she's doing the West Coast at 7 p.m. Okay, that's interesting. Then she's November 14th, she's doing it in Asia at 7 p.m. And then in, uh, in November 15th, in, in, in uh, England and Europe at 7 p.m. Yeah, so those, those times are the local times. So when it's um, 7 o'clock on the West Coast, it's going to be 10 o'clock here in New York. Um, and then I think, because I, I did the math on it um, today as well, because my, my family and friends are in Australia. And right now, it is, they're just waking up. You know, it's just the morning over there where it's the evening here when we're doing this interview. So, you know, I wanted to make sure I could give them a selection of times. They might want to watch it at 12 o'clock on a Saturday morning. They may want to watch it at nine o'clock on a sun, on a Sunday. You know, so there's different options for the people in Australia. Um, right. And they, they, can go, they can go to the Daisy Jopling, uh, Daisy Jopling Foundation .org to find out about the tickets because they were, it's going to be streaming. It's only $20 a person, you know, you know, one person see it and it's going to be so beautiful, so fantastic. I mean, I saw the run through on uh, Wednesday night, and right. it was great. It was just great. We were um, that the show um, was the, pre the the night after you saw it on the Thursday night. Right, right. So I now my last question to you is: What advice would you give to somebody starting out in the music world? Um, you know how to you know how to make a living for the you know a, you know in a, for the rest of their life, you, you, you get what I mean. It's a really good question. Um, I guess it depends how old they are. Like if I'm looking at like when I'm doing the Mr. Simon stuff, they're two, three, four, five. I'm not expecting them to become professional musicians. You know, the, the, the children that I mentor are aged, I think the youngest is around, for me, it was around about six or seven, up to about 15 at the moment. And it's, I think it's like a little bit later on or when they're starting to like show like some natural ability. Because I'll work with kids, even if they're not really showing natural ability, but they're passionate about it. I, I, I'm not thinking, you know, um, that all of my students are going to go on and become professional musicians. I have actually. Is, had... is, that what, is that where they get their love of music, you know, with, with you when you're first starting out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because I'm just totally about making it fun for them. And I think that's what music should be, you know, like my, my experience, you know, bless her, but had miss, had I had a different teacher to the late Mrs. Peary, um, maybe I would have been a piano player um, because I just didn't connect with her. So it's really, really super important to find, uh, you know, a teacher that, that they, that they can relate to and, and have good rapport with. Um, you also so, teach, right? Where, if somebody good. wanted to take lessons from you, where would they find you? Uh, you can go to you can anything about me. You can go to just my website, which is simonfishburn.com. And it's and so what you, what, Fishburn, but without the E. So it's F-I-S-H-B-U-R-N.com. And there's a contact page. People can email me there and get in contact with me there as well. That's fantastic. Simon, fantastic. I really enjoyed this. You were just Thanks, animated, Andy. wonderful. Just oh, wonderful. And, and it's been so wonderful just being a part of this and seeing all of your interviews. You know, I did my homework because I'm like, who is who else is going to be on this island? I better find out who these people are. And this is where I came and found out about that. So thank you for, for, for doing these podcasts and these interviews. Um, and uh, have fun with the rest of the band. It's a very, very enjoyable because, I mean, you're part of everybody that's involved in this in this um, dream of passion here is that we all have a passion for what we're doing, for mentoring, for the music, for the beauty. Um, it's it's going to be so beautiful. And what's interesting that what I see is right now everybody in this business is having a problem because they don't have a, they don't have a venue to play because they can't invite people. And so here we have a, 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 the set that um, 
uh, Neil Kaplan, um, you know, who manages the island, is um, it's so wonderful that we're doing it. We did it with him. And then with Deke lighting it up the way it is, it's going to look so spectacular. And now, hopefully, you know, people will want to watch it and we can make some money uh, from people watching it um, to help the foundation. I mean, it's a great fundraiser. And, and to see this kind of thing done, um, it's just great for everybody and great for, you know, young people to get involved. Music, if you get involved young, you know, in music, it sort of gives you a, um, uh, I mean, music is the way, it leads the way to romance, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, I've had some romance in, in music. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, the next the, I, think the future of, I think the future of music definitely is, you know, it's going to take a little time for us to get back to live shows you know so so definitely like it's it's fantastic that we're, we're we've recorded this show and we're going to do it virtually um because you know this is really the way of the future i think you know we can reach a lot more people and um i think that's the silver lining for me at least for me and i'm sharing that with as many musicians as i as i know about this pandemic is that's forced us to really get involved in online delivery of, of music music lessons music mentoring performances um even just do a little video on your phone and then stick it up online you know i've done right. mi like lots more videos heaps more as we say in australia heaps more mate heaps, heaps right. more videos more. than Give i than i was doing before and it was always something that's like oh i know i've got to do more content online ah, you know got to set up my camera and da, 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 you know but this kind of forced me to do it so um how do you like how do you like playing without an audience though uh well yeah that's that's the challenge <laughs> you get done there's no yeah yeah but there's i mean there's streaming there's you know there's 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 zoom so i've had sh shows where i've had multiple people on there um it is it's it's obviously challenging because of the delay you can't play with other musicians because there's a delay it's like on the phone you know hello hello right so we haven't got there just yet there's technologies that are being developed to do that but um yeah so it's like yeah da, 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 and then nothing and then stop the video and you're like oh i gotta take a breather you know <laughs> but in my head i'm imagining people just loving it so you know it's it it's the next best thing it really is so i think you know when we get back to doing live performances you know we're all going to be much better at doing video editing and and, and online delivery and right. um you know it really is where we're heading but to do a show with daisy with a live band even though we were socially distanced and and a, and a small audience was just, i'm lost for words it was just magic it was really really magic well i can't wait i can't wait to see now. the film i can't wait to see the film myself and everybody else um you go to daisyjoplinfoundation.org you'll find out the information and you're gonna just love it love it so i want to leave everybody with this message um may you always have a dream of passion and come back next week for the next uh, victim. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Errol.